Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and Jerry's here with us, too, and that makes this Stuff You Should Know with the Snip Snip Edition. Snip Snip Edition. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, we're talking about getting the snip, a.k.a. a vasectomy, a.k.a. a vasotomy, if you really want to be smart about the whole thing. Um, yeah. And Chuck, our, our buddy Dave Roos helped us with this. And I have to say, Dave is a really big proponent of vasectomies. And I get why, but he really mm-hmm. is all about vasectomies. I suspect he would get a couple if he could. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. Now uh, now that I know about them, it is a remarkably basic thing mm-hmm. that is being done. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes that's sort of the the beautiful simplicity of certain medical procedures is it's like, eh, just cut that thing there and you're all good. <laughs> there's your problem. That's not cut. Yeah, there's, there's your problem. <laughs> so it is remarkably easy. The recovery time is really fast. It's relatively cheap. Uh, even if you don't have insurance covering it, which most most people don't in the United States, and yet in the U.S. and a lot of other countries, um, the the it's really disproportionate the number of men in reproductive age who have a vasectomy um, mm-hmm. compared to the number of women who've undergone tubal ligation, getting your tubes tied, and yeah. both are basically equally effective, but getting your tubes tied is way more. In, involved. It requires general anesthesia. The recovery time is much longer. And it seems to basically come down to men just being scared of some guy monkeying around their junk with a scalpel um, and worrying about what the after effects will be. But it turns out totally unnecessarily and unfairly. Yeah. I mean, we'll get to, to some of the myths. Um, and I would say it's it's equal parts being scared of those myths. Mm-hmm. And quite simply, the patriarchy. I mean, yes, kind of full stop. Uh, men saying like, uh, "You need to take care of that on your end, right?" Uh, and and then we can start having uh, unprotected sex. And the, and that's why a lot of people frame it as it's a, a real gift that a man can give to um, his wife or his spouse or his sexual partner. You know, the person he's monogamously having sex with. Because we should point out, vasectomy is going to handle pregnancy basically every time. Um, It's not going to help with STIs. So if you're running around exposing yourself to monkeypox, a vasectomy is not going to help with any of that. It's going to just help with the pregnancy part. Yeah, and uh, I hope that counts as a blanket statement. So when we say things like, and now you can have, you know— all the sex you want without using a condom, without fear of getting pregnant. Right. We don't. We don't mean like, hey, step right up. Uh, <laughs> what, what we mean is, is you know, with your uh, monogamous partner, right. You can now live, and you know, with your monogamous partner, you can uh, get tested, and you uh, can know that that part is safe as well. But sure. we are definitely not saying just that means you can go around and and spread your uh, uh, seed. Your, your biological material. <laughs> no, no, that was even worse somehow. Oh, it's terrible. Dave uses, well, we'll get to the material part, but it's such a gross way to describe anything right. that comes out of your body. But you mentioned the patriarchy. Here's a, a patriarchal um, stat for you. 39% of American women aged 35 to 44 uh, have had their tubes tied. 39%. Do you want to know how many uh, men age 35 to 44 in America have uh, had a vasectomy? Oh, it's got to be at least 25, right? 13%. 13%. (laughs) That's it. So that means that, um, what, more than about three times, right on the nose, three times more women have their tube side than men undergo vasectomy. And hopefully, like, as people are hearing about this stuff— um, it becomes less scary and maybe more men will be prone to do it because if you're looking to stop having kids or never have a kid, th- this this is a really good way to go. It's safe, it's effective, and again, it's relatively cheap and the recovery time is like nothing. Yeah, uh, some of those myths that we mentioned uh, that are not true or is that the operation is painful, which is not true, mm-hmm. uh, that it affects sex, 
uh, that it affects your erection, it affects your orgasm and ejaculation, it affects your sex drive and testosterone, it means you're not a real man. Like, none of those things are true. And if any of those dudes were speaking to you, yeah. if any of those are reasons why you don't want to get a vasectomy, then you have no reason. Right. So just, like, that is a fact. Yeah, and we'll go into those in more detail. But yes, all of those are totally incorrect. Probably everything you think or worry about vasectomies is incorrect. That's that's a pretty good bet, actually. Yeah, it, it, or if your reason is, well, I don't know, I may want to have kids one day, that is a very good reason. Sure. Because uh, as you'll see, there is a reversal surgery, but it— they definitely haven't perfected it. It uh, is expensive. It's more invasive. Um, this is something you really need to consider uh, very, very strongly as a long-term life decision. Yeah. Like if you were like, oh, what's one more kid? And you're like, I regret having this third kid. Maybe it is time to talk about getting a vasectomy. <laughs> or if you're like, I think this world is grossly overpopulated. We're treating it terribly. Uh, I don't want to introduce yet another human into it and screw it up even more. Um, that might be a good reason to have a vasectomy too. And apparently that's an increasing um, uh, reason for Gen Z and millennials getting vasectomies these days. Yeah, or if you have already bore a couple of children and you look at your partner and say, hey, dude, uh, I don't want any more kids. How about you get a vasectomy? Mm -hmm. And they give you a, a reason that equates to, I want to keep my life options open. Hmm. Uh, That's a different conversation. Yeah, then you're with the wrong person. <laughs> right. You never know. On down the road, I might meet someone else. Right, no, right. No, no. I guess I should say, Chuck, we've, we've been talking almost exclusively about like men and women, you know, like biological sex, um, as far as vasectomies go. Uh, and I actually looked, I was like, is this part of transitioning in, in the trans community? And I saw that it probably isn't. I mean, you can imagine like going from uh, transitioning from um, male to female, um, you might want to get a vasectomy. But I saw specifically that the hormone therapy renders that like null and void. There's no point in getting one from what I saw. Right. So that's why we're using the terms that we're using and the words we're using. Right. So um, one of the things about a vasectomy, one of the reasons why it is so great is because it is basically 100% effective at preventing pregnancy. Yep. And like I said, tubal ligation is, is just as effective. Um, but as far as other stuff that men can do to prevent, uh, to act as birth control, uh, I mean, like, vasectomy is far and away superior to all of them. Like, you've got coitus interruptus, <laughs> a.k.a. the pull-out method. Yeah. That's only 78% effective. I'm and surprised it's that high. I am, too. You yeah. can just ask the pull-out king if that works or not. <laughs> hey, get in here, pull-out king. <laughs> and then uh, condoms are 85% effective. That seems high to me, too, but I guess, actually, no. On, in, uh, on second thought, it's probably pretty accurate. But even still, that's a 15% chance every time you have sex that you're going to accidentally impregnate your partner. Mm -hmm. That's what's so great about vasectomy. You have no worries whatsoever because there's a whole bunch of steps that we'll talk about that say, okay, you're good to go. Go forth and have sex with your partner that one partner that you're monogamous with and is monogamous with you uh, as much as you like without a condom for the rest of your life. Anytime you want, just go ahead and do it. Do it in a, a, a changing room at Target. Do it in your car. No, don't do it do at the police station when you get arrested for doing none, it in a changing room in Target. None of these places <laughs> you should do that. But you could because you don't have a condom on you and it doesn't matter in that sense. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned it being relatively cheap. Did you say the actual number, which is about a thousand bucks? Yes, I did not. Okay. Th okay. Yes, you did not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's that kind of episode, Chuck. A, th a thousand dollars is certainly nothing to sneeze at, but, no. um, tubal ligation is about six times that much. Mm -hmm. Um, condoms aren't cheap. So if you're, if you're choosing to have a lot of sex and wear a lot of condoms and you're going to run up a bill there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it doesn't take super long. It's a 20-minute outpatient surgery. Yeah. Uh, very, very low risk of complications. Uh, it does not require general anesthesia like tubal ligation does. It's just local anesthesia. Which that right there is like, there's your 
like, how much do you love me kind of thing? Are you going to let me risk dying on, under general anesthesia compared to your local anesthesia? That's the that's what makes that kind of conversation hard when you're like, should you get your tubes tight or should I get a vasectomy, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and recovery time. It's just a couple of days later uh, um, for vasectomies, you're kind of doing pretty well, and it takes a few weeks or up to a few weeks for recovery for tubal ligation. Yeah, because tubal ligation is so much more invasive. You know, it's, it's a much greater surgical procedure. Um, and then one other thing that is really important is, like, like I said, it's considered a gift from the guy to his wife. Because you're saying like, hey, you don't have to worry about this stuff anymore. You don't have to take the pill anymore. You don't have to get an IUD. You don't have to get injections. Um, you don't have to get your tubes tied. Like, I'll handle this for both of us, and I'll, I'll take one for the team. And that, that really is like a genuine gift that you can give your partner that, I mean, like, they, I imagine they will value you for it at the very least, it, to put it in a really sterile way. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> no, sadly, no. I'm not that All sharp right. today. Well, let's take a break. I'm going to sharpen you up. Okay. And we're going to come back and talk about uh, the procedure right after this. All right, so we're back. Uh, we're talking vasectomies. I, I keep saying it like it's got an <laughs> F in there, vasectomies. Mm -hmm. Vasectomies. And the point of a vasectomy is to keep your sperm away from your semen. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where Dave uses a word that just cracks me up. It's that material. Uh, he says that semen is all of the material <laughs> that comes out of the penis during ejaculation. Right. For some reason, I don't know. It just sounds like you're pulling a silk scarf out of a sleeve or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. But when you add biological in front of it, it gets even yeah. worse because you're like, for some reason, you just imagine it everywhere. <laughs> for, as I do, at least. Uh, but sperm and semen are two different things, right? Yes. Sperm is just one tiny component, component of semen. And um, you could make a really good case that semen exists if you're into intelligent design and that kind of thing, as a vehicle for sperm. But what humans have cleverly figured out is you can keep the semen, you can get rid of the sperm, and you can do this, you can spread the biological material uh, all over the place without any worry of getting pregnant because all you're doing is removing the sperm from entering the semen. The semen comes out like normal, it's just sperm free after a, um, a vasectomy. That's right. Uh, it's called a vasectomy, by the way, because of the vas, V-A-S, deferens, uh, a.k.a. the sperm duct. Um, that is basically th the target of this operation. Mm -hmm. It is a, a tube in the scrotum and the pelvis. It's called the vas deferens. There are uh, two of them uh, because you have two testes. Sure. And so a vas deferens, uh, if you – well, well, we'll talk about what you actually do, but it's called a vasectomy because of that. Right. And you can remember that by saying a vasectomy makes a vast difference in your sex life. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> that was off the cuff. I do not have that it. written down at least. <laughs> so um, with, so with, a, with the vasectomy, the vast difference is just cutting. That's it. The vast difference from each testicle. That's, that's all there is to it. I mean, there's a little more to it, but it's really that basic. You want to talk about the procedure? Yeah. Uh, like I said, you've got these two vas deferens. Each one uh, is about 12 to 80, uh, 18 inches, but size isn't important here <laughs> from what I've been told. Uh, and they run from the base of your testes up around to the back of the bladder where your seminal vesicles are. And uh, like you said, their their job is to take your sperm Mix it in with the rest of your uh, semenic material. Sure. Uh, which I don't think we said what it was. It's fluids from uh, the seminal vesicle, fluids from the prostate, mm -hmm. uh, and from what's called the bulb. Oh, I had it earlier. The bulbarethral glands. Glands. <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. Go ahead, hit the, me. I think it's bulbourethral. 
Yes, it absolutely is. <laughs> so that to me is one of the worst words I've ever seen. It looks like what it describes uh, in my imagination. That word <laughs> looks like it. Yeah. Can't you can't you just see it? I can. But you put all this stuff together and you've got the biological material that comes out of the penis during ejaculation, like Dave says, right? So That's right. So the vast deference, its role is to move sperm from the testes to, I think, the prostate um, to deliver this to your, um, to your semen. And again, when you have a vasectomy, all you're doing is cutting the vas deferens, so you're removing sperm from the equation. Um, and now I think it's probably time to talk about the surgery step by step, right? And I think when we do this, most people who don't know about this are going to be amazed because it is wham, bam, thank you, ma'am kind of surgery. Considering what you're doing and the effect that it has, the outcome it has, it's yeah. incredibly simple and fast. Yeah, and maybe we should queue up yakety sax. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> Did you ever uh, see Dolly Parton at, um, <laughs> oh, I can't remember, what is it, Glastonbury, I think, festival? And I she's, did. <laughs> she said, I can play yakety sax backwards, and she turns around and plays it. Oh, my God. That lady is Unbelievable. a gem. Still, she is. after all this time. She is. National treasure. International treasure. Global. Uh, so what they're going to do is they're going to numb – uh, the area that they're going to be working on with uh, local anesthetic on either side of the scrotum. Mm -hmm. That may be the most harrowing part for, for people listening to this. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to make two small incisions at the top of the scrotum so they have access to uh, each vas deferens. Mm -hmm. And they're going to, I love that he says gently, <laughs> they're going to gently withdraw uh, part of it through the incision. They're going to snip it. And they're going to seal it up. Uh, sometimes it's stitches. Sometimes they cauterize it. Uh, sometimes it's a combination of things. Uh, but they're basically just going to seal up that tube. Mm -hmm. And they're going to close those tiny incisions up with stitches or maybe glue even. That is it. Whatever they have lying around. That, you're right, right, exactly. A little sawdust and spit. Sure. But that's it, man. That is it. And again, yes, the guy is cutting into your scrotum, into your junk. Um, I should say, I mean, guy in a gender neutral way. Sure. You know, who knows who your urologist is? But they, like, they're, they are cutting into it. They know what they're doing. It's really just cutting through a little bit of skin that, again, has been anesthetized locally. And th I mean, that's it. Like, this, it's almost like cutting a rope and then taking a lighter and burning each end so that it doesn't fray any longer. That's mm -hmm. pretty much analogous to a vasectomy, except the rope is in your your scrotum and they don't use a like a Bic lighter. They probably use something else to cauterize it. Yeah. And then you're riding your horse the next day. Actually, you probably don't want to be doing that the next day. You want to wait a week to ride your horse, but the <laughs> point taken, you know? Uh, there are also what's called no scalpel vasectomies, which are not completely no scalpel, uh, but there are no incisions uh, made in a technical sense. They use a, <laughs> this sounds even worse, actually. They use a, a punch tool mm -hmm. to punch a small hole in the skin uh, of the scrotum, and then they withdraw the section of the vas, uh, vas deferens that way. Mm -hmm. um, you still have to use a scalpel to uh, cut the cut the tube, uh, but apparently you heal up a little bit faster with this method. Yeah, because there's no actual incision. It's just a puncture wound, basically. So, yeah, I mean, it's smaller surface area to, to recover, I guess. Yeah, uh, and if you're thinking, Josh, Chuck, or doctor, doctor, mm -hmm. wh what about all that sperm? I got so much sperm, where's it going to go? <laughs> Isn't it just going to build up and that, you know, that's a problem. Uh, that is not what happens. Your body absorbs the sperm. You don't get some big, like, massive sperm buildup. Let me tell you about your sperm and where it matures over 70 days. Isn't that awesome? Ooh. It's in the epididymis, and your epididymis is... 18 feet long, and it's coiled okay. up in your <laughs> testes. Each testicle has ep an epididymis that's 18 feet long if you stretched it out. And this is where the sperm kind of gathers and grows and, and gets ready for action. And apparently after your vasectomy and the sperm has nowhere to go, it stays in the epididymis, which naturally absorbs it back into the bloodstream. Because if you, you know, don't see any action for a while, your sperm can get kind of old and your body wants new, fresh, good sperm to, to be used. So the old stuff yeah. gets absorbed anyway. All so that's already happening. Yes, exactly. This isn't like some new thing that your body has to do. It's just that's all it does now is absorb sperm. It doesn't ejaculate it anymore. 
Right. Um, you mentioned the term besotomy earlier. Technically, that's probably what it should be called. Uh, ectomy is, is usually when you are removing something and mm-hmm. you're really not removing anything in this case. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you want to get super technical, you could call it a besotomy. And your doctor might just say, yeah, 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 I got you. Wise or guy. they might be like, ooh, I'm going to give you a nice Valium too. Because you impressed them so much. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's one other thing about the sperm. There's a kind of vasectomy called an open-end vasectomy where they just cauterize the um, the tube leading to your prostate. Uh, and the tube that's coming right out of your testicle is left open so that the sperm actually just does flow out into your scrotum and it gets absorbed in there as well. Oh, and is it like one of those uh, – Spaghetti sprinklers that kids run through when you turn it on? <laughs> yeah. No, it's like one of those um, those like air blow guys that like yeah. tire stores <laughs> use to bring in the customers. I think it's more like that. Okay. Or either one because they're both delightful. <laughs> um, this, like we mentioned, takes about 20 minutes. Doesn't even have to take that long. Sometimes I can get you in another in as little as 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you might get a little bit of pain meds, but... Um, and you know, this is, uh, from, from Dave sort of telling us firsthand, uh, that after the first day or so, it's really not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're going to be resting for 24 hours. You're going to be chilling out, uh, in bed, basically. Um, you want to wear, and this is pretty funny. Um, you want to wear tidy whities very tight underwear mm-hmm. or a jock strap for 48 hours. <laughs> right. Probably guess, the tidy whities is preferable. I don't know. Jock strap's a pretty good look. You just don't want anything swinging around because you have two incisions on your scrotum that have been stitched up, and you don't want to, you know, loosen the stitches. I think is the point. Yeah. What else are you gonna do? Cold pack. No, no, sure. no doubt. Like actual frozen bag of frozen peas could work, um, yeah. <laughs> because it could become inflamed. Your body has been insulted, and it's going to react with inflammation. That helps with it. Um, again, you're going to have pain meds. You probably won't need them after the first day. You might need like Advil or Tylenol or whatever your regular analgesic is. Um, but like we were saying earlier, you can't ride a horse for a week, right? Yeah. In a couple of days, you can do desk work and stuff like that and you're off your feet, but, um, no sports and, and, uh, no sexual activity for a week. So here's the sort of trick is you're going to still have sperm in your system after a vasectomy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a chance if you had unprotected sex uh, with your partner right away uh, that you could get them pregnant. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need to clear the system. So it takes up to 15 to 20 ejaculations to clear the system out. So if you want to go back to having sex that, you know, like literally one week after you have had this operation without getting pregnant with your partner. Mm-hmm. You're, you know, do the math. You're, you're welcome back to seventh grade, basically. Yes. So, like for a good three months, they're basically like you need to really be careful, and they're going to get you in there um, afterward as part of this post-operative care. About you know anywhere from like a, a month and a half to three months later to say, okay, give us a sperm sample, and we're going to see if you have any any guys swimming around in there. And uh, if you pass, they will say, you got no sperm, go forth and have fun. Um, and if you don't pass, they'll say, okay, well, we need to, to, you know, keep safe a little longer and then come back and give us another sample. And they'll keep doing that until there's just no sperm found, like zero, 100% no sperm. <laughs> so 0% sperm, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Am I reading this correctly, though? Because you can have sex seven days later. Mm-hmm. It takes 15 to 20 ejaculations. Right. Yet they check you out 6 to 12 weeks later. Yeah, they're saying, like, you behave as if you did before your vasectomy for 6 to 12 weeks. Like, if your wife or your partner was on the pill, she should probably stay on the pill for 6 to 12 weeks until you get the all clear. If you use condoms, keep using condoms. And during that time, when you have sex, there is that risk that you will still get pregnant until you get that all clear from a sperm test that finds no sperm. Right, but is that because they assume it will take 6 to 12, 12 weeks to have those 20 ejaculations? Oh, That's what I'm asking. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. I don't know because that does seem like a really long time, doesn't it? Well, I mean, that's why I said welcome back to seventh grade. If you want to knock that out in a week. <laughs> I gotcha. Then, uh, I'm glad you went back and explained that 
I uh, I thought you were you were saying like you were worried about getting someone pregnant. I, I can say this in a grown up way. Does that mean you can masturbate twenty times in a week and clear out your system and you're you'll be good to go? Or or is it really like you really need to think about this six weeks later to twelve weeks later? I don't know. I would guess if you boasted to your urologist that twenty ejaculations <laughs> is not going to take you six weeks. Right. They might say, okay, we'll schedule this for three weeks from now or four weeks or whatever. Right. You know, I'm curious. I would yeah. think so. Yeah, yeah, I, I would guess so. All right. I wonder yes. if they have like a, a wall of fame in the office. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just covered. Clear coated. in two days. <laughs> um, so, yeah, f- 15 to 20 ejaculations, an ejaculation is an ejaculation, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have to just be through intercourse or coitus, I think is what the kids call it. Th- that is true. <laughs> I, well, how many times have we said ejaculation in this episode? Eh, more than 10? I would say so. Uh, you want to take another break and then come back and talk about some of the risks involved? Because there are risks, it's true, but they're just fairly small. Yeah, let's, get, let's do that and get back to it. Okay, so when you cut into a scrotum, when you cut a part of an internal network of tissues um, and seal it back up and cauterize it, there are risks. Um, even though you're not under the risk of general anesthesia, um, you could conceivably get an infection at the incision site. Mm-hmm. Um, that you can get blood clots um, inside mm-hmm. of the scrotum. Blood can show up in your semen. Your scrotum can become bruised. All of these things at least the first few that I mentioned, are stuff that you probably will get as a result of a vasectomy, but they're going to clear up fairly quickly. And again, that bag of frozen peas can really help with the inflammation. The Tylenol or Advil can help with everything else. There are some some actual possible longer-term complications that you should be aware of, though, too. Yeah, there's a very small <laughs> percentage, I think uh, 1% to 2%, of people who have chronic pain after the surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, and these are uh, the people in this category or the part of the percentage of people who one day might want to get this reversed because of that chronic pain. Yes. Uh, an abnormal cyst called a uh, spermatocele. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Uh, that could develop uh, in the coiled tube located at the upper part of the testicle uh, that. Uh, collects and transports that sperm. But these are, like we said, these are down, if you're down in the uh, low single percentage points, it's, you know, considered low, very low risk. Right. Um, and, you know, the the upshot of it, the, um, the upside of it, I should say, is that, again, <laughs> um, you actually will probably experience, at least as far as some studies have found, uh, an increase in sexual satisfaction. Because, Cutting your vas deferens has nothing to do with hormones. It has nothing to do with um, your ability to get an erection, your ability to ejaculate. There's another one. Um, instead, again, it's just removing sperm from the equation, and that's it. That's right. Uh, testosterone, don't worry about that. Uh, that is produced in the testes like the sperm, mm-hmm. but there's a different kind of cell. Uh, it's called the late Leydig cell mm-hmm. or the Leydig cell. I like the second one better. Let's go with that. The Leydig cell. Um, but it goes, it, it has a one-way trip. It goes directly from the testes into the bloodstream. Right. It does not go through the vas deferens. There is no impact whatsoever on your testosterone uh, and sex drive. And in fact, it may <laughs> actually increase your sexual desire. Um, they've done studies. They did one in Germany that said that, uh, that, uh, if you've had a vasectomy, you have a greater, or at least they reported greater satisfaction than the control with orgasm, with sexual desire, with satisfaction of intercourse, mm-hmm. with erectile function. Spontaneity, that's a big one. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it may just be psychological, like, all right, I'm, I'm free, I don't have to worry about this anymore, so that, that'll probably increase all kinds of happiness. Yeah, exactly. I, I get the impression that that is um, from this German study from, I think, 2017. 
Um, they they surveyed both uh, men with vasectomies and their partners uh, and found that the partners were like, yeah, actually, it's a little more arousing. The actual act of sex didn't change for me at all, but there's something there's something going on here. And I think I would chalk that up to spontaneity and not having to stop to, like, put on a condom or, you know, feeling freer because you didn't have to take a pill that day, that kind of thing. It wasn't like... Doc, I got to tell you, we started doing some crazy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever done it in a Target changing room? Whoa, whoa, whoa. no, no, no! <laughs> Don't tell your doctor that. <laughs> so, um, we we said it's you know a thousand dollars, which is like you said, nothing to sneeze at at all. But compared to tubal ligation, which is six thousand dollars at least. Um, It's much cheaper. The thing is, in the United States, insurance companies don't have to cover vasectomies. They do have to cover tubal ligation procedures. And it's probable that that accounts, in addition to the patriarchy that you mentioned, full stop. Um, In addition to that full stop, some people just being cheap and saying, like, no, I mean, like, we can get a tubal ligation for, like, 50 bucks. And, uh, you know, rather than vasectomy for $1,000. And if there's any man out there who does not want to get a vasectomy, he's going to hammer that point home every Mm. chance he gets until he he gets his way. Yeah, maybe. Uh, We mentioned people getting uh, wanting these reverse about 6%. Uh, of people who get a vasectomy end up wanting that reversal. Uh, Like we said, some of those come from the chronic pain category and other people, you know, want to have kids and decide, oh, I've made a grave mistake. Mm -hmm. Um, That'll cost you between five and 15 grand and it'll take four to six hours. And even when you do, uh, if it's considered, you know, quote unquote successful, uh, your pregnancy success rate um, is between 30 and 90% moving forward. Uh, so some people say, just go IVF then if you want to do that and get that sperm directly from the testicles because uh, it has a much better success rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do that if you want. Uh, that'll still cost you a bundle though. IVF is not cheap. Yeah, but it's a lot less invasive and permanent than reversing your vasectomy, right? That's right. Um, remember how we said that uh, vasectomies are like 99% effective or something like that? They have like a 1% failure rate. I yeah. think we said that. That failure rate comes very often from something called recanalization. Did you see that part? I don't think I saw that part. So recanalization is where the vast deference grows back together. It creates new tissue that basically go around the stitches or the clamps or the cauterization Mm. and grows new tubes that seek out and connect with the other end of the vast deference and reconnect it's which is just goes to show you that nature finds a way. Yeah, life but, finds a way. But again, oh man, is it life? I almost had it. Um, but again, this is really, really rare. And apparently, the positioning of the two, the separate ends of the vas deferens has a huge effect on that too. Like you don't want to leave them anywhere near each other. <laughs> you know. Like, oh, I see you over there. And one of the things about that reversible vasectomy. Um, like, apparently, that's a holy grail in urology. Uh, and they're looking at ways to, to basically temporarily um, create a vasectomy. There's stuff called reversible inhibition of sperm under guidance. It's a type of gel that you can put into the vas deferens, and then it has to be flushed out later on um, to remove it. And then all of a sudden, it's like your vasectomy was reversed. Yeah, th- this falls under the same category of, like, simplicity, like, I imagine they were trying to think of an easy way to reverse this, and somebody was like, "Hey, you have any gum? You have any chewing gum? <laughs> <laughs> right? I got <laughs> like a we great could just idea. we could clog up that tube, and that's basically all they're doing. They're clogging the tube mm-hmm. uh, with a gelled implant, and uh, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. You what, better make sure that 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 clog is pretty tight. Yes, uh, apparently that has a failure rate from one Indian study in two thousand nine. Of four percent, where again a vasectomy has one percent. Yeah, I think safety is the concern there, right? Absolutely, right. So I saw it explained as with a with a pill with women, um, the control group in when you're figuring out safety is pregnant women, and um, pregnancy is riskier than the side effects or complications from taking the pill. So the pill wins out. It's safer. It's justified, and that's how it gets um, um, the green light for use. Um, oh. With the male pill, the control group is just healthy men. There's no pregnancy. So the male pill has to stop 
sperm production without side effects, like any side effects. Because if you go beyond a healthy male, um, as the which is the control group, then all of a sudden it's less safe and it probably won't get approved. Oh, uh, so there actually, that. yeah, there actually is. Although I don't know how hard they're working on a male pill. Probably not so hard. <laughs> although you never know. Why is that funny? <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not say. Come on. Um, all right, we'll finish up with a little bit of talk on eugenics. Uh, We did an episode many, many years ago about sterilizing addicts, Mm -hmm. specifically, uh, which is – go back and listen to that episode. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, please forgive us. Probably somewhat outdated at this point, but who knows. Yeah, just the use of addicts, I think, is outdated. So, But it's still – it's a pretty interesting episode. But this is a notion that started out all the way back in the mid-1800s. Veterinarians started experimenting – uh, with dogs, uh, giving dogs vasectomies instead of castrating them. Mm-hmm. And in the 1880s, started performing, uh, performing them on, on men. And in 1899, of course, it didn't take very long for a eugenicist to get involved and say, hey, this is a great thing because we can just uh, essentially neuter criminals. Uh, we can neuter people who are mentally ill. We can neuter people who are poor. Right. And that'll solve a lot of the world's problems. Yeah. And so the eugenics movement really took this up. Um, there was a guy named Dr. Harry Sharp in the United States. He was a leading uh, performer of vasectomies among eugenicists, among anybody, I would guess. He actually performed the first vasectomy for non medical reasons. Um, it was on a 19 year old inmate at a reform school in Indiana who had complained of excessive masturbation. And so Sharp gave him a vasectomy and said that he, quote, became more of a sunny disposition, brighter of intellect, and ceased to masturbate, end quote. And um, he kind of went from there within a decade on just a tear where anybody who he deemed or the eugenics movement deemed undesirable to the gene pool should be, uh, should receive a vasectomy. Yeah, um, alongside him was a, uh, American named Albert Oshner uh, published a book, or I guess at least a pamphlet called Surgical Treatment of Habitual Criminals mm-hmm. uh, that advocated for, uh, you know, exactly what it says, making criminals sterile. Um, and it, it was just sort of a time in the world, and especially in the United States, where they thought that, like I said, if you were in an almshouse, if you were in an asylum, um, if you were certainly, if you were in prison, then it was a, a good option to force a vasectomy on somebody. And this happened uh, to an alarming degree. I think uh, through the end of World War II, they estimated about 320,000 uh, forced sterilizations uh, without consent. Uh, I did not see a racial breakdown, but you can bet that it affected people of color more uh, than others. Mm-hmm. It just would make sense. Uh, Because that's how it's kind of gone in this country. Yeah, and it wasn't – I mean, America was definitely an early proponent and leader of eugenics. But if all this sounds, you know, ghastly familiar, that whole thread was picked up by the Nazis in the early 1930s. And they sterilized countless people, both um, through vasectomies and um, through tubal ligation. And apparently – I didn't realize this – Switzerland had – early eugenics law, apparently the first eugenics law, and they targeted the Roma, and the Roma could were still subject to uh, involuntary vasectomies up until 1972 in Switzerland. Isn't that insane? Yeah, that's that's shameful. And by the way, when I said it made sense that they uh, forced sterilization probably on people of color more, Mm. you know how I meant it, right? (laughs) Everyone? Sure. (laughs) I, I didn't mean that made sense in any kind of ethical way. It, it made sense because that's how people of color have been treated in this country. I like the the person who thought that this had to have been like their first episode, <laughs> and now you explained it to that one person. Just want to clear that up. All yeah. right, good. Everybody knows Chuck. So ending it on eugenics is kind of a sour note. So let's talk about one more old timey thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's just misguided pretty great medical procedure. It is misguided, but it's not nearly as bad as uh, vasectomies for eugenics. Um, there was an Austrian endocrinologist named Eugene Steinuck, 
And he said, I've got this great idea. If I cut just one vas deferens, the other one will still be able to contribute sperm to the semen, but the severed vas deferens will give up on sperm and go into overdrive for producing hormones like testosterone, which will give men just this huge boost of virility. And he started going crazy performing it on everybody who would step up. Yeah, basically like... If you want to increase your sex drive, you can have this elective procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, and people like Sigmund Freud and uh, writer William Yates used this uh, procedure and underwent this procedure mm -hmm. to boost their sex drive. Yeah, and apparently um, they were like, well, actually, testosterone works totally differently. And the, what you just did to all these people doesn't work at all. So uh, I guess Steinock went, um, retired in disgrace. Um, and if you thought that was a pretty fun factoid, prepare for this one, Chuck. I think you should take us out with this. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dave found a statistic uh, because, and who knows if this is correlation or not, but there is a statistic uh, because you, you're supposed to lay around for a couple of days. And when you're laying around for a couple of days, maybe you're reading a book, educating yourself, or maybe you're just watching a lot of television. Uh, but didn't they find that, I think the finding was that the procedure went up a lot during March Madness NCAA basketball tournament time so men could have an excuse to lay around and watch it. Is that right? Mm -hmm. A 30% increase in vasectomy procedures in the U.S. during the first round of the uh, NCAA basketball tournament. They call it vast madness. I got to know if that's true, if that's why. Got to know. Well, the only way to find out, Chuck, is to undergo a vasectomy procedure and ask your urologist during the middle of it because you won't be under general anesthesia. It'll be local. Mm. Uh, you got anything else? I got nothing else. Okay. Uh, well, Chuck said he's got nothing else, which means, of course, it's time for listener mail. That's right. Uh, this is from our buddy, Mark Kuntz. Uh, Mark and Gail Kuntz are longtime listeners. Mm-hmm. And, and real life pals of mine that came to our show in Cleveland and uh, Gail is a longtime movie crusher but Mark wrote us an email about uh, suicide awareness month which it is right now oh yeah uh, and this is a Mark is you know he's out there doing like the, the tough work great dude uh, September is back to school season guys and suicide prevention month which means youth suicide prevention is on my mind more than usual uh, as you know I'm a licensed art therapist at Clark County Educational Service Center in Springfield, Ohio, helps schools meet the mental health needs of thousands of students. Uh, most people think of suicide prevention uh, with youth means focusing on trauma and handling uh, and handing out hotline information. And of course, sometimes you do those things, but my favorite suicide prevention program, and the reason I'm writing is uh, called Sources of Strength. Uh, that is a youth-led suicide prevention program that has been used in schools across the US and Canada and Australia. Uh, sources of strength uh, are things like uh, positive friends, mentors, and mental health. These are some of the protective factors that we can rely on when we're stressed or to help us get through a crisis. Uh, and for the past year, I've been trying to get sources of strength in every single one of my county schools. And with funding and support from the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation and Prevention First, with an exclamation point, mm -hmm. Uh, schools in Ohio can implement sources of strength at no cost. Nice. Uh, so if you're listening, he, he just won a grant for like 10 grand or something like that. Which a is genius great. grant. He's won it before, I think. But he says, if you're listening to this and you're in Ohio, uh, you can learn by visiting sourcesofstrengthohio.org. Even if you're not in Ohio, you should still visit the sourcesofstrength.org website and learn about the source's eight protective factors. Also, adults need protective factors too. Mm hmm uh, I'd like to thank both of you for always advocating for mental health as well as spreading useful and beneficial information to all of us and for being positive people in the world. Your voices mean so much to so many. Greatest thanks from your old pal, Mark Kuntz. So, hey, Mark and Gail and your cute pets. Uh, I appreciate the work you're doing. Yeah, same here, Mark. Um, that's magnificent stuff. Thanks for writing in to let everybody know. Um, if you want to write in like Mark did and just basically say, I'm a hero without saying I'm a hero, uh, we would love to hear from you and tell everybody about that. You can wrap it up, spank it on the bottom, and send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.